Good morning, welcome to Soul City. Let's stand together. Come on, we're gonna sing. Lift up the name of Jesus in this place. Come on.
Good morning, welcome to Soul City Church. We're so glad that you're here today. We're gonna continue on singing, lifting up the name of Jesus, fixing our eyes, fixing our attention on Him, Him alone. We wanna teach you a new song this morning that literally just proclaims the goodness of God because of His love, His undeniable love, the love that never stops pursuing us no matter where we are or where we've gone or how far we go that there truly is nothing that can separate us from the love of God and that if you just simply open your eyes and pay attention you can see that amazing love is truly alive in your life so we're going to teach you this chorus we're going to sing your love is undeniable your grace is unmistakable over and over time and again when i think i'm done that is where your goodness begins so let's sing this out together your love is undeniable your grace is unmistakable and over and over time and again when nothing come done, your goodness begins. Your love is undeniable. Your love is undeniable. Sing your grace. Your grace is unmistakable. Yeah. Over and over, time and again. Nothing come down, your goodness begins. Your love is undeniable. Oh, your love, love. Your love is undeniable. Your grace is unmistakable. Over and over, time.
cross and all that it costs nothing can take it from me oh i won't forget you had it
There's no wall you won't kick down, lies you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountains you won't climb up, coming after me. No, there's no wall you won't kick down, lies you won't tear down. critical of him because they thought he hung around with riffraff, you know, with the marginalized of society, essentially with sinners like you and me. And so Jesus told him this story using a metaphor that we don't use very often. This is found in Luke chapter 15. Jesus said, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Look at this image. When he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and he neighbors and he says to them, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. My friends, God has an outrageous, reckless love, so much so that even though there might be 99 people already in his fold, he says there's still one who matters to me who's wandering. And I don't know if you personally identify today more with the 99 or maybe you are trying to find your way back to God, but he is pursuing you. He loves you with a reckless, outrageous love, and I'm so glad that you're here today. My name is Nancy Beach. I'm one of the sheep in this place. I also do a little teaching. And I want to ask you to turn to one of the sheep standing next to you and just say good morning, exchange your names, and then go ahead and take a seat. As I was driving to church this morning, probably like many of you, um, I had the radio on, and I was getting an update on the killing in El Paso with 20 people dead and 26 injured, and then heard of another shooting at 1 a.m. this morning in Dayton, Ohio, another mass shooting of nine people, drive-by shootings right here in our own city of Chicago. And it struck me that what we need to do together is what people have done all through the ages when they're confused and angry and very sad we pray it's what we know how to do so i want to invite you to pray with me for the people so closely affected by these horrific events let's pray together gracious father we are without words really 
It feels like just another sock in the stomach to hear about the loss of life in these places over and over again, the violence and the division. And so right now, God, we pray for the families and close friends whose reality today is so different from their reality yesterday. And we pray that you will be the God of all comfort that they will sense your presence even if they don't yet know you, and that people who do know you, God, would step up and step into these situations and bring hope and listen well and try to usher in some sense of peace in the midst of the storm. God, we don't get this, we don't understand it, but we don't know where else to go. And so we come to you, the God of peace, and ask that you would help those people today in a very real, real way. In the name of our shepherd, Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Well, I am so glad that you chose to join us for the gathering today. And if you're new around here, I want to encourage you to grab one of these cards that's stuck in the Bible in front of you or under your seat. And uh, some of you might be new, and if you'd like to fill that out and hand it in at the information counter as you leave, we'd love to meet you. Others of you might have been coming for a while, but you think you're ready. The flip side says, I'm ready. And if you think it's time to get involved or to just get some more information about how you could step in, I'd encourage you to do that. You know, at Soul City, we exist for one reason and one reason only, and that's to lead people into a transforming relationship with Jesus. We're all about life change, and that's for all ages. So just this past week, a dedicated group of staff and volunteers took our middle school or junior high students away for a week at camp. Now, decades ago, I volunteered in a junior high ministry, and I just want to say it's stretching. Um, that is a challenging age group. And so they were away for a week, and I have some statistics to report to you. Uh, three of those students decided that they wanted to follow Jesus for the first time. Eight of those, stu yeah, eight of those students said... It's time for me to recommit my life to this journey, to take it more seriously. And 17 of those students said, I want to embrace the adventure of inviting my friends to get to know Jesus. And zero of those students had a fist fight, so that's really good. So they survived the week, and if you're looking for a way to enter into ministry that would be deeply fulfilling and stretching, I invite you to stop at the Information Center. They'd love to talk to you. This is the time in our gathering where we have an opportunity in the context of worship to give a portion of our resources back to God, and it's something that we do with great joy. You can give by texting or online, or in a moment, the hosts are going to come forward with buckets. Um, but if you're new here, this is not for you. You're our guest, and we're so glad you're here. This is just for those of us who call Soul City our home. So I'd invite the hosts to come forward and do that, and while they are receiving the offering, I want to give you a little quiz. Um, if you used to watch Sesame Street or some of those shows, they would say one, one of these things is not like the other. And they'd give you a little quiz. I'm going to put four things up on the screen. One of them doesn't belong, okay? So we have Lollapalooza, <laughs> Summer, The Voices series, and Shark Week. So look at each other and see which of those do you think does not belong. It's a tricky question. All right, the answer is B, Summer. All those other things are ending today, okay? There's no more Lollapalooza or Shark Week. And this is the last one of our Voices series. But summer is not over, please. It's not over, Alleluia. We will savor it, right? We will continue to savor it. But it is the, the last week of our Voices series, and I can't imagine a better person to wrap it up than our good friend, Harvey Carey. He has been a friend of Soul City for years. I hold him in such high regard and am thrilled to get to sit through this message one more time. You are in for a treat. Before he comes up, Pastor Jarrett wanted to say a few things about Harvey, so listen to this. Hey Soul City, we are wrapping up our Voices teaching series and I couldn't think of anyone better to close out this teaching series than our friend Harvey Carey. Uh, Jeannie and I have known Harvey for I don't know, over 25 years. We've known Harvey, traveled the world with him speaking. He worked for a season for a long time at Salem Baptist Church here in Chicago. And then a decade or so ago, planted Citadel of Faith in Detroit. And we are so impressed by what God is doing through his leadership and through that church. And we are just so privileged to have him back here with us. I think Harvey is maybe the guest speaker who's spoken the most at Soul City. He should have some kind of award for that. 
So until we figure out what kind of award to give Pastor Harvey, can we just at least give him our love and welcome him to the stage? Can we welcome Harvey Carey to close out our Voices series right now? But can we give Jesus a hand of praise? He's the one who deserves it. He really deserves it. Hallelujah. What a joy it is to be back here at Soul City. And uh, I was sharing with um, some of the staff that, yeah, I started being with Jared and those guys when I was about five years old. Um, so they're ancient and I'm not. But um, so glad to be here and really more excited about what God has been doing through transformation in this community. It's so uh, exciting every time I come to hear about more people that are being touched because of the ministry of this church and for that we're so grateful so grateful to see my friend Alex and his family all the way from Brazil they are family members of mine and they heard I was going to be here and they came all the way here to just know uh, <laughs> but we're so glad to see them but uh, so grateful Soul City again to be here with you all I believe that today's message is uh, one of those messages that is a bit convicting and maybe challenging in some areas. So I'm going to ask that we would pray again as we approach the word of God together. Father, we don't approach your word uh, without uh, reverence. Uh, we realize that your words are spirit and life. So we pray in these next few moments that your word would penetrate uh, the darkest places in our hearts. Uh, those places, God, that your word needs to be made relevant and we pray again, God, that you would be the teacher and that we would be the students. Uh, less of us and more of you is our constant prayer. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. You all, there are a lot of chasms. There are a lot of spaces that separate us. Uh, for one reason or another, there are things that sometimes stand between us and something else or someone else that we deeply care about or are deeply concerned about. Uh, and sometimes, you all, if we're not careful, those spaces that separate us will keep us from actually experiencing abundant life. Uh, many of us have not learned how to cross those chasms because the challenge seems so daunting. The, the picture that you have there is a very familiar one, but it probably won't be that familiar until you see the next image in a few seconds. But uh, prior to what was built to bridge this gap, people had to take ferries and take steamboats across this channel uh, just to be able to actually access an entire other part of land um, that literally was under-resourced because it was not connected. Uh, but then they decided to build this that many of you all might be more familiar with. And this bridge that was built created uh, unbelievable commerce uh, development of these incredibly very different pieces of land that were separated, but because there was a bridge built, uh, those communities that were unable to at one point connect now are able to connect. Uh, over a mile long and some 60 feet wide, this uh, huge, uh, iconic bridge has connected those things that were separated. I wonder how many of us know of situations that we find ourselves separated from people. Sometimes we automatically think about these big things like, well, I'm separated from this demographic or I'm separated from that group of people. But sometimes it can just even be within your own family. Sometimes there can be tension, there can be uh, differences that actually continue to make us further and further apart from each other and not closer. Uh, many of us that have been married, uh, over time you thought that, that marriage would actually make them become more sensible. <laughs> you thought that over time marriage would make them finally kind of come together and realize that your way was right, right? Uh, but guess what? They actually became more of what they were, right? Uh, and so if they, they still don't let the seat down and, uh, and you have to deal with that issue or they still uh, are doing projects that they buy all this uh, stuff for and leave all the stuff stacked up in the backyard or in the garage because they saw a commercial about building a deck and they started getting ready to do that. And so you all, uh, and, and then for the other, maybe you ask, you know, how's your day? And you thought that maybe over time she would just realize she doesn't have to give you deep detail about this, but just tell you it was good. But instead, she says, well, it started this morning when I woke up. And so you over time, you all, don't raise your hand, brother, put your hand down. <laughs> He's like, yeah, that's me right here. You all, so, so sometimes the, the, the spaces that are between us can just be the differences of, of just a husband and wife, but maybe even our children. Sometimes the generation gaps, the language that they use, the things that they do seem so foreign to us that we almost create these gaps. Even in the church, I find people say stuff like, oh, those millennials, I wish they would. So whether we know it or not, even sometimes generationally, the, the ways in which we are can be a gap or a difference. 
but you all becomes even more acute and even more difficult and challenging when the gaps that separate us keeps us from doing the mission and the ministry of Christ. When God calls us to be those who would be light in a dark world or salt in a world that needs unbelievable presence of life and preserving, we sometimes, because of the differences, will choose not to cross those chasms. We'll choose not to mind those spaces or mind those gaps that are between us. God has called each of us to be bridge builders. God has called each of us to be those, no matter what the chasms are, to cross them so that we can be in his uh, love, arms, feet, hands of Christ. And so you all, I want to talk today uh, from several texts that will give us a little bit of an understanding about how Christ modeled for us crossing these chasms. You all, I believe that as Christians, we have often heard many scriptures, are familiar with many scriptures, but oftentimes, you all, we don't know how to apply those, right? We kind of know these Bible stories, but it becomes kind of almost folklore. Uh, so John chapter 4, John chapter 4, verses 4 through 30, and if you've got Bibles in front of you, actually, if you wanted to use those, uh, it's page 863 in the Bibles that you have uh, in front of you or in your uh, seat area there. So page 863, but John chapter 4, beginning at verse 4, it says these words. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would give you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself and his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become a spring in them of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you have you have you're right when you said you have no husband. The fact is that you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true, sir. The woman said, I can see you are a prophet. I bet she could. (laughs) Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. Salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then, the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with the woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water pot, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out of the town and made their way toward him. I know that's a lot of verses to read, but I like the Bible. Okay. (laughs) 
So let me just share this you all. The, the context is that Jesus, um, unlike many of the other Jews who chose to go around Samaria, uh, the Bible says that he felt that he had to go through it. Uh, the Jews and their disdain for the Samaritan people, these half-breeds, these people who did not worship the way that they worship and really did not hold to a lot of the religious practices that the, uh, the Orthodox Jews did. They said these Samaritans were not even worth uh, contacting, being near. They really had no dealings with them. So they literally would build systems to go around Samaria. If they had to go somewhere and Samaria was on the way, they would build in extra time to go around it. I know for some of us, we say, well, I have no context for anything like that. I don't know of anybody building highway systems around ghettos or around communities where people don't want to be bothered. Who could ever do something like that? Well, just look around you and see that it's done quite a bit. You all, uh, out, of, out of a desire to ignore these people, these people were not recipients of the grace and the community communication that these Jewish people were able to give them even a message about God. So we find Jesus having a mandate, Jesus having a calling to go right where the Samaritans were. I wonder how many of us sometimes are called by God to go in the middle of situations that everybody else seems to avoid. The Bible says Jesus went right to Samaria and when he got there you all he saw a woman coming to draw water at noon. Now this doesn't seem like much to us but in those those days, you all, for the women of that day who had to get, get the water and bring it back to their families and homes, they did not come in the noonday in the blazing sun, but they would come early in the morning when, the, when the, it was much cooler and it was not, you know, as, as hot. So this woman was coming by herself at noon, and there's a back story to that when someone is coming by themselves at noon. And so Jesus sits down at the well, and he begins to talk with her. For us, no big deal. Back in those days, huge for several reasons. Not only he's a rabbi and he's speaking to a woman. Women in those days, uh, as a matter of fact, the Jews would pray a prayer. They said, I thank God that I'm not a dog and I thank God that I'm not a woman. They were that, they, listen, women had such a low status in the eyes of Jewish men that they were not considered at all to even be communicated with or to be spoken to. But not only was this a woman, but this was a Samaritan woman. So if there was somebody to not be talking to, she had two strikes against her. But so what did Jesus do? As opposed to ignoring her like everyone else would, as opposed to making her feel marginalized even more, Jesus sat down at the well. As a matter of fact, God knew she was going to be at the well before she knew she was going to the well and he sat at the well and began to talk with her asking her for some water and she immediately says to him listen you uh you know you're not supposed to be talking to me because I'm not like you I am a Samaritan woman the first thing Jesus does in crossing the chasm of difference is first of all being intentional to want to cross it he said, I'm going to go to a place that others don't go, and I'm going to do something that others are not doing. He goes to the well, he goes to where the woman is, and he engages her in a conversation. She immediately says, you shouldn't be talking to me because I'm a woman, you are a, a, a man, I'm a Samaritan, you are a Jew, uh, you should not be asking me about getting any water. He said, if you had any idea who you were talking to, you would realize that the water that I have to give you is more sustainable than the water that you're getting out of this well. He said, if you knew who I was, you would be asking me for a drink and I would give you living water that would spring up out of you to eternal life. And notice what she says. She says, let me get some of this water. He says, first of all, she says, where can you draw? You ain't even got nothing to draw with. She was not spiritual. She could not understand what he was talking about. Don't be upset when people who are not spiritual don't understand your spiritual talk. Don't be, you know, don't leave Soul City ready to evangelize the world. Talking about, listen what I learned and then be grieved when somebody doesn't understand what you just said. If they are of the flesh, then they can only understand things of the flesh. Those that are the spirit understand things of the spirit. So don't be sidetracked when your friends don't understand your spiritual stuff. Amen. Tell my next to you. Amen. All right, so then what happens is she says, where's, what you, where's the thing to draw with? He says, don't worry about that. I have some water that will spring out. She said, listen, I want this water so that I don't have to keep coming here. She did not say, I just want living water so that I don't have to be thirsty again. She said, I won't be thirsty again and have to keep coming 
here. Being there was a sense of shame for her. Being there was a sense of isolation. Being there was actually a reminder of what her life was actually full of. And we'll find out in a minute what her life was full of. And being there was a constant reminder that she was ostracized, not only as a woman, not only as a Samaritan, but also someone that had been shunned by the community. She says, uh, give me this so I don't have to keep coming here. And then, and then he says to her, uh, well, you know what? I, I've got some water for you. She says, well, listen, everyone who drinks uh, from this well, uh, these are the people that Jacob uh, built this well for. Uh, what, what, what are you offering that's more important than what I've already been familiar with? And he begins to tell her, listen, we're not going to get caught up in worshiping in this mountain or worshiping in Jerusalem or who dug this well. Let's dig a little deeper. Why don't you go and get your husband and come back? She said, I don't have a husband. He said, you have spoken well because you have had five husbands and the joker you with now ain't your husband. <laughs> and in that moment, you all, she said, I perceive that thou art a prophet come from God. For no man could tell me these things unless the Lord. Did. Listen, you in that moment, what did Jesus do? He, he moved from a kind of larger conversation to a deeper conversation but he earned the deeper conversation by the first conversation you cannot get into deeper conversations of heart issues when you've not first began to be civil at a different level of conversation. And for many of us, we don't know why breakthroughs are not happening in our situations with people that are on these other sides of the chasm. But listen, you can't start trying to change people before you talk to people. You can't, you can't figure out how to get somebody to see your point of view or interact with you in a deeper way when you haven't first begun to just have a time of communication with them. I'm always amazed and fascinated with people who want to do evangelistic endeavors or servant activities to help other people but feel as though they don't have enough to do it or they don't know enough to do it. Pastor, I really want to be uh, a servant of God. I want to go into the, this community, but I don't feel like I, I know enough. So I need to have some more training on how to go into that community and I need to know what to say and I need to know how to say it and let me say something I think that there's some wisdom to that because sometimes people well intentioned can go into certain neighborhoods certain communities and certain conversations and say the wrong thing I had a church, bless their hearts, who came to me from the suburbs of Detroit, and they brought uh, blankets, wonderful winter blankets, to give out to all of the poor inner city people. And the blankets were given out in July. And they said, they just don't seem grateful. I said, it's July. <laughs> it's July. And they said, well, is it possible that you could have one of your uh, members, because we gave them all out, because, you know, people are going to take stuff, though. They might not going to use it, but it's like, hey, give me to it. Could you have one of your members, Harvey, uh, uh, have a look of gratitude uh, when we give it to him? Because we got to capture this picture for social media. Uh, maybe a, a, a tearful gratitude look. I said, where's your leader? Uh, and when I spoke to the leader, the leader ended up, you know, realizing that they had not done the type of training. So sometimes, you all, it takes some care and it takes some wisdom communicating with people. However, listen to me. Sometimes we over process. And there's some of us in the room that are afflicted with the paralysis of analysis. That means you think too much and you think yourself out of activity. In other words, Harvey, I have a burden for this community, so I need to understand everything about it before I do anything. So I need to have a focus group together. We need to do a demographic study. And once we do the demographic study, we need to do some video series that will give us a better understanding of that culturally relevant so we can go in. And you know what you've done? You've not done anything. So can I tell you what you need to do? Instead of trying to overprocess, do something like saying hello. Say, what's up? Say, hi. You don't have to have any training to say hello. You don't need any special training to say hi. For some of us, you all, the chasm that we must cross is just first showing up. Listen, y'all, it would be amazing if the believers of Jesus Christ would go to places where Christians are not going and just show up. That's why I like going to clubs. I know y'all don't like it. I know y'all don't. I know y'all don't. I don't go to clubs and dance. I don't go to clubs and turn up, but I go to clubs and show up. And guess what? I rent out the VIP room and let the rest of the club come in because they never go to the VIP room. When they go into the VIP room, it's a prayer room. Yes, that's what we do. That's what we do. So listen, all I'm saying is this. Show up. Jesus showed up. And when he showed up, he earned the right to a deeper conversation. Go get your husband. And she says, I'm not. 
in that relationship. He says, well, you've spoken well. And then she tries to change the subject again and goes off talking about something else. And he says, listen, no, 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 no. Uh, the one that you have been longing for, the Messiah that you've been seeking, guess what? I am he. And in that moment, this woman realized, oh, my God, the Messiah that we've all been waiting for. I've been sitting across. He came and crossed the chasm to meet me at a well. Why? Because the women of the town, listen, she done had five husbands, and we don't know which one she done took from one of the other women. They would not allow her to be with them in the morning. She had to come by herself. But Jesus said, I'm going to leave the 99, go after the one, and sit with the one at the well because I I need to see this woman at the well come to know me. And she dropped her water pot and said, come see a man who told me everything about who I am. Could he not be the Messiah? Don't tell me what showing up and being available and crossing the chasm will not do when we do it. And so you all, Jesus models for us how to cross the chasm. Now the question is, okay, we know Jesus did it, Pastor. I know that Jesus always gives us ideas of how we can cross the chasm. But how do I cross the chasm? What is it that you could give me practically that could help me maybe even verse by verse figure out the kind of people that I could reach? I'm glad you asked. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 23. I'm reading from the message version. It might read a little differently than the version that you have. Paul, you all, this master um, evangelist, uh, missionary uh, individual who wrote and penned the greater part of the New Testament, he's writing this uh, letter to the church at Corinth, and he's actually explaining to them the process that he's gone through to reach so many people. All of us marvel at how many people that God allowed Paul to reach. But he says, I'm going to give you all a, a sneak peek, kind of raise the hood of my life so you can get a chance to see what I had to do to be able to reach the wide group of people that I was able to reach. He says, even though I'm free of the demands and the expectations of everyone. In other words, nobody's making me do anything. I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people. Notice what he said. I don't have to do anything, but I voluntarily have chosen to do something. I don't have to to be the one to cross the chasm, but I choose to be. Let me just say something, and when, it, when, when I say it, don't make any noise, because then everybody will know it's you. Have you ever wondered why God always makes you to have to be the one to make things right? Have you ever just got an attitude privately with God? Why do you have to be the one that forgives? Why do you have to be the one? Listen, here you are broke, and everybody keeps asking you for money. And you always give it to them, right? And then when you have a need and you're asking somebody for money, conveniently, they just don't have it. Why are you everybody's friend? Why are you the shoulder that everybody can cry on? But when you need to cry on somebody else's shoulder, you don't do it. So listen, the, 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 the desire that many of us have as relates to crossing the chasm is I'm already doing enough. I'm already being required enough. I'm not going to go any extra mile to make any other difference outside of what I'm already doing. And God says, that's not your choice. Did you realize that when you became a Christian that your life is no longer your own, that you've been purchased with the price and it's no longer you, but it's Christ in you? It's not what we want. It's what he wants through us. And so if God is calling us out of our comfort zones and calling us out of those spaces and places that we're not used to chat, traveling to, then we have to say, you know what? I don't have to do it, but I voluntarily choose to do it so that a greater end can be achieved. He says, I am choosing voluntarily to become a servant to any and all so that I can reach a wide range of people. Well, what kind of people are you trying to reach? First of all, I want to reach religious people. Oh, man, I love religious people. You want to meet some of the strangest people in the world, meet religious people. Oh, man, they just do stuff that none of us do. I mean, listen, what's so funny about religious people is they only sometimes do things at a specific time, like in church. I never see these people who are having these deep moments with God, having them in uh, Jewel, Osco. I never see anybody in Jewel talking, hey, hey, I never see that. In Jewel, Osco. I never do. I never see anybody in the middle of deep worship in produce. Never see it. <laughs> you all, religious people, you all, can sometimes be people who are not reached. Listen, there are people who are religious who are not in relationship. Right. 
There are people that are in churches or in religious whatever systems who are far from God. They may not even be Christian. They may be in some other religious practices and they consider their religion their God. And Paul said to those who are religious, I became like them. Which means I had to know what they thought. That's why I wear suits. I do. They tell me every time I come to Soul City, Harvey, don't wear a suit. You don't have to wear a suit. So I didn't wear a tie. That's as, this is, this is deep as I can get. It's a big deal. I know they had cuts on their pants and jail and, 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 and stuff. You know, you know, one day Jared's like this. Next day, yeah, I get it. Don't you tell him I said that. Don't you tell him. So you all, because God has called me as a bridge builder, that there's sometimes you all, I even choose with my attire intentionally to reach some people. Because there's some people, you all, believe it or not, who are grieved by people that don't wear religiously sanctioned clothing. And so I've chosen that, right? Because I'm a burden for God's church and a burden for the religious. He said, to those who are religious, I became like the religious and I also became like the irreligious or the non-religious you all we've got to have a burden for people who are far from God and who are not religious that's why I love this church because if you're here and you don't know Christ you are in the right place this is not a place that will not make you feel welcome because we realize that anybody who is religious or is a Christian or is a follower of Christ they didn't start out that way they had to have a process and that process sometimes involves questions and sometimes anger Sometimes a whole range of emotions, and this is a safe place to investigate it. But you all, if we're not willing to become like the irreligious or the non-religious, how do they think? How do they feel? What, what things kind of concern them? Then we'll never reach them. He said to those who are irreligious, I became that. He said to the meticulous moralists and the loose living immoralists, to the defeated and to the demoralized. Then he said to whomever. He said, whoever is in this world, I'm willing, listen, to die to myself to learn a little bit of their story before I demand them hearing my story. How many of us are in situations right now where God has given us a community? Given us a sphere of influence with individuals who are so different from us and we think that their difference is a problem, but it's really an assignment. Have you ever thought about the fact, here, here's, the, here's the, the fruit of the Spirit, right? We, if you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit, right? And if we have the Holy Spirit, then the fruit of the Spirit is a part. We, all, we, we have all the fruit. We may not have every gift, but we have all the fruit. So we've got love and gentleness, kindness, right? The only way that love and gentleness and kindness can actually grow is when it is confronted with something that demands it to act. So have you ever wondered why... God keeps sending the most unlovable people around you? (laughs) Have you ever said, God, I come against this. I I come against these evil people that you keep bringing around me. Why are you bringing these people who I don't have any patience for? He's like, because the fruit of the spirit of patience needs to grow. Could it be? That the chasm of difference that is surrounding us is by God's design. So that those of us who are filled with the spirit and filled with the answer can actually be a blessing to the world. He says that to everybody that I came in contact with, I chose to serve them by A, getting to know them. And as I got to know them, then I could meet them where they were. Not to change them, not to make them become what I want them to be, but to just... Connect authentically with them. What does your playlist look like, sound like? What kind of movies do you go to? Because maybe the patterns that we always have might determine the people that we consider as the others. And when there's a whole bunch of people who are in the other category, then those people sometimes you all are not even real to us. They're the others. Unfortunately, what happened down in El Paso was somebody who targeted some others. And what would happen if the church of Jesus Christ would make the decision to no longer allow ourselves to keep looking through the lenses of others, but realize that through Christ and through his blood, he's come to redeem all of us. And if we could show the love of Christ, we could bridge some gaps. You all, I know many people like to talk about this, but the political divide in our country is just insane. 
And whatever side of the aisle you vote on, and please don't assume you know what side I vote on just because I'm black and I am black, but don't assume you know what everybody do because you don't. But let me just say this. At our church, we're a multicultural church. We have people that are on both sides of the aisle. I told them one day, bring your MAGA hats. Bring them. Wear your MAGA hats. And also, I want everybody else to bring your Black Lives Matter shirts. And let's sit down together and let's listen to each other. And, 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 tell you, and you know what happened? This is what happened. As we listened to each other, people that were vehemently opposed to the other side for once said, wow, I never saw it like that. Yeah. Wouldn't it be amazing if the church of Jesus Christ, no, we will not agree on everything. No, we will not see things the same. But in Jesus' name, we should be and can be civil and show a dying world that a church can be united by the blood of Christ. Amen. You all, we are called to cross the chasm. Let's do it. And it has to be an intentional act. What did he say when he finished this? He said, I did not take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. That's why I go to the club. <laughs> man, sometimes it's grieving. It really is to see what people are doing. But man, how would I ever even know? Do you know some of us are so saved, sanctified, filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit and fire that we don't even remember what it was like to be lost? We don't even have friends that are far from God. We don't have associates that are far. We don't have anybody in our life that we can talk to that is far from God because we've chosen to now that we are believers to abandon even knowledge of what used to be. And remember how you felt when you were out there? Imagine if you could have a bit of compassion and a bit of concern and a bit of love for them. Finally, he says, I've become just about every sort of servant <laughs> that there is in my attempts to lead those I meet to a God-given life. I did all this because of the gospel. I didn't just want to talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. He said that because of the gospel... Because of what Jesus did in crossing the chasm to us, then I will cross the chasm to others. Because of the reconciliation that he's allowed me and God to have through him, he's now given to us the ministry of reconciliation whereby now we help those be connected to him and then us to each other. You all, God, that's the mandate that God has given to the church. And here's the challenge. Who in your circle, who in your sphere, has become irritating to you. That's the very one that God is calling you to show compassion to. Who's the one in your sphere of influence has become just the, you know, it's like grating, right? When you go to work, you're just, you know, some of you all have done, you've built, your, one of your coworkers is Samaria. <laughs> One of your co you know, you find out what time they go on the break, and that's when you don't go to break. Come on, don't look at me like that. You find out which way they walk, and you walk around the other way because that's Samaria, right? What would happen tomorrow if you must needs go by their desk? That's when this message becomes real. What happens when somebody else sees politically different than you, as opposed to judging them and demonizing them? What if you say, you know what? I may not see it the way you see it, but I can understand how you can see it that way. I can understand how that can be a value of yours. And you know what? Can we pray together that God would let our country be the great country it is? And would you would we believe God would allow it to be all that he wants it to be? And however, can we agree on that? And can you imagine the church could do that? If we could embrace diversity ethnically and not feel as though it had to be some huge effort. But that it's a natural outcome of those of us who've been saved. Because if God reached out to crazy us and broken us and separated us, then surely we can reach out to those who are far from him. And so as we get ready to pray, I'm going to ask that you right where you are would be honest about where you are in this journey of the chasms that separate you from others. Maybe it's family members and for the first time maybe you'll go home and pick up the phone and Call your sister who you haven't talk, talked to in years. Your brother who you've been estranged from. And say, you know what, I just want to reach out to you. Can you imagine they may hang up on you? But that's not on you. You've done what's right. 
Maybe it's that job when you, instead of going through Samaria, you'll just go to Samaria, right? Maybe it's praying for somebody that is really far from God that you feel is unreachable and asking God for the strategy. If we do these things, church, our world that's a lot fractured will become a lot less fractured. And we'll begin to see the power of God heal and bring the kind of order in God's kingdom that he's called us to have. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord Jesus, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for caring about us so much that you crossed the chasm by dying on the cross for us. We were lost in our sins, separated from you. But you so loved us that you chose to become a servant, to wrap yourself in flesh, to die on a cross. And when you rose again, you said you've given to us now this ministry of reconciliation. You've given to us the keys of the kingdom, the power to be the church, your body. And so, God, would we be your hands, please? Would we be your feet? Would we be your mouthpiece? Would we be, God, the hug that someone needs? Would we not be the finger of condemnation, but instead, Lord God, the embrace of love? God, we pray in this post-Christian America that we've created that we would not continue, Lord God, to be irrelevant, but that we would be salt and light. We honor you for what you've done, but now we lean into what you've called us to do. And so, God, would you help us to build bridges? Build bridges with the poor. Build bridges with the marginalized. Build bridges with the other. That we, the church, would not be one more reason that someone who is far from you says that I don't want to know their God. Because their God doesn't even talk to me. Help us to talk to them. And as we talk to them, you talk to them. And we'll be so careful to give you the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen.
part of our gathering today and if this has stirred up anything in you that you'd like to pray with someone our prayer hall is is open they would love to pray with you next weekend we're starting a brand new series titled handcrafted all about how each of us is uniquely made and now may we go out into our spheres of influence wherever they may be and be those who bridge the chasms have a great week everybody bless you